Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Sarah Tinker, and I'm here with Kensington Unitarians on Zoom this autumn morning. Welcome to this time that we spend together with music, words, silence, and the good company of one another. Today's gathering has been uh, created as um, as a celebration to honour the 250th anniversary of the birth of composer Ludwig van Beethoven and our very own Harold Lorenzelli will later be exploring what such a life might teach us about being human. Gatherings like this, they give us the chance to, well, to think a bit deeper. We're taking time out of life's everyday tasks to, to delve a bit into the mysteries. As Unitarians, we don't offer answers, but we do value the questions. What makes life meaningful for people? How might we deal with adversity? And where does creativity find expression in our lives? So my hope is that there'll be something in this service that speaks to you and to your life issues. Something that might resonate with you in the week ahead, perhaps, something that might help you make sense of the week that's passed. And this hope also applies to all those who'll be joining us sometime in the future by watching this as a video or listening in on a podcast or reading this script. So I invite us all now to just to take a moment, take a conscious breath perhaps, feel ourselves settle. And as we breathe out, we might have a sense of letting go of anything that might stop us from being fully here in the present moment. We might breathe in a sense of connectedness through our shared humanity. And as this, this chalice flame, as it burns brightly, this symbol of our worldwide progressive religious community, as this flame burns brightly, so may we find a path of love that shines for us all and helps us to kindle the flame of creativity in our own lives and in our hearts. It's, um, it's been the Transgender Day of Remembrance this week. This is a day to speak out about the violence inflicted on trans and gender diverse people the world over. And I, I wanted to bring some words from someone who's just died, a far more gentle death, age 94, the writer Jan Morris, who in the 1960s underwent gender reassignment after transitioning from male to female. And in her book, Conundrum, Jan wrote so powerfully about her sense of self and the, the importance of being allowed to be who we know ourselves to be. And here are just a few extracts to lead us into a time of reflection and prayer. So these are the words of writer Jan Morris from Conundrum. She writes, I was three or perhaps four years old when I realized I had been born into the wrong body and should really be a girl. I remember the moment well, and it's the earliest memory of my life. I had reached the conclusion myself that sex was not a division, but a continuum, that almost nobody was altogether of one sex or another, and that the infinite subtlety of shading from one extreme to the other was one of the most beautiful of nature's phenomena. What was important was the liberty of us all to live as we wished to live, to love however we wanted to love and to know ourselves, however peculiar, disconcerting or unclassifiable, at one with the gods and the angels. Some beautiful words, I think, from writer Jan Morris. 
And so let's join in a time of reflection and prayer now and quietly align ourselves. Quietly align ourselves within our own way with that which calls us to be the best that we might be as well as that which accepts us just, just as we are. With shame for the cruelty, human cruelty and ignorance, let us remember all those who have died violently just for being themselves. Let us live in hope that our human society might better learn to value diversity and that we as individuals might find the courage to admit our own lack of understanding of others who seem different from us. May we dedicate ourselves to the task of learning more in life and of living with creativity and the greatest compassion for everyone, not just those who are like us. And in stillness now for a few moments, we can speak our own prayers. Oh, and may these yearnings, may these yearnings of our hearts guide the actions of our lives, that love might prevail this day and all days. And to that aspiration, we can join now in saying, Amen. So may it be. And now let me hand over to Annie Fowler, who has a reading for us from Helen Keller about Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. You perhaps know the name of Helen Keller, who in the early 20th century became the first deafblind person to gain a university degree. She went on to a life of service as an educator, an author, and founder of the American Civil Liberties Union. I'm going to read some extracts from a letter she wrote to the New York Symphony Orchestra in March 1924. And here's how Helen Keller describes listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony over the radio. Dear friends, I have the joy of being able to tell you that, though deaf and blind, I spent a glorious hour last night listening over the radio to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. I do not mean to say that I heard the music in the sense that other people heard it, and I do not know whether I can make you understand how it was possible for me to derive pleasure from the symphony. It was a great surprise to myself. I'd been reading in my magazine for the blind of the happiness that the radio was bringing to the sightless everywhere. I was delighted to know that the blind had gained a new source of enjoyment, but I did not dream that I could have any part in their joy. Last night, when the family was listening to your wonderful rendering of the Immortal Symphony, someone suggested that I put my hand on the receiver and see if I could get any of the vibrations. He unscrewed the cap and I lightly touched the sensitive diaphragm. What amazement to discover that I could feel not only the vibration, but also the impassioned rhythm, the urge of the music. The intertwined and intermingling vibrations from different instruments enchanted me. When the human voices leapt up thrilling from the surge of harmony, I recognized them instantly as voices. The great chorus throbbed against my fingers with poignant pause and flow. I have never been so enraptured before by a multitude of tone vibrations. 
As I listened with darkness and melody, shadow and sound filling all the room, I could not help remembering that the great composer who poured forth such a flood of sweetness into the world was deaf like myself. I marveled at the power of his quenchless spirit by which out of his pain he wrought such joy for others. And there I sat, feeling with my hand the magnificent symphony which broke like a sea upon the silent shores of his soul and mine. Thank you, thank you, Annie. It's such a moving reading, isn't it? Um, so for our time of meditation today, we're going to have an extended piece of Beethoven's music, part of his Moonlight Sonata. So I suggest we all ready ourselves for that now, get ourselves comfy. Um, I know some people like to uh, switch off their videos at this point for a while, or just adjust your position. And maybe take one of those lovely deep breaths that allow our bodies to relax a little more. Perhaps straighten our, our backs or lift our shoulders and roll them back and down. Whatever helps you to ease out those tensions that our bodies take on. Sometimes tensions that we just are no longer aware of. And perhaps as we ease our bodies, Perhaps the gentle rhythm of our breathing now will help our minds rest a while from their busy, churning, everyday thoughts. Well, that's if your mind's anything like mine. And as, as we listen to Beethoven, um, well, perhaps some new and interesting perceptions might arise. When the, um, when the music ends, we'll hold just just 30 seconds or so of silence, and then Harold will be taking over.
Then this year is the, as we've already heard, the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. And it seems only right that we should honor this fact in some small way, which is why, of course, we've incorporated some of his music into today's service. One of the things that occurs to people when we hear his name mentioned is, of course, that question, wasn't he deaf for a good part of his life? And of course he was. And this seems an almost incomprehensible fact that he was able to write music that has inspired people down the years, which he himself could not hear, fed only by his imagination or at the most dimly perceived. He wrote of the consequences of this in painful prose. He felt socially isolated from those about him, could indulge in no intelligent conversation, no meaningful exchange with his peers, and so rarely ventured out into society. I am, he said, obliged to live as an outcast. As the years advanced and the deafness increased, he moved more and more into that inner realm of the imagination where he continued to practice his art. It is hard to imagine the possible catastrophic effect such a loss might have on someone for whom music was the supreme expression of what he saw as a higher realm of experience, if not the highest. Music, he said, is the one incorporeal entrance into the higher world of knowledge which comprehends mankind, but which mankind cannot comprehend. It transcended all wisdom and philosophy and led to a revelation of the divine. It was for him the mediator between the spiritual and the sensual life. It was the way he communicated both with himself and with what he saw as a higher reality a unique source of inspiration, and as he thought, the electrical soil in which the spirit lives, thinks, and invents. It is therefore a mark of his indomitable spirit that he continued composition even as his deafness increased with age. Indeed, he felt that he had a duty to develop those God-given talents with which he had been endowed. They were a gift which he genuinely felt were from a realm beyond the mundane. And whatever the cause may be for his inspiration, no one can doubt his commitment, his burning passion to express what words could never touch. It is generally recognized that Beethoven's music created a harmonic realm with a sense of a vast musical space through which the music moves freely, and the development of musical material creates a sense of unfolding drama in this space. In this way, his work creates a story where there are ups and downs, happiness and remorse, good and evil, so to say, and an ending. Often with his style of composition, it is as if a sculptor were dealing with the primeval clay out of which there is fashioned a new creation. There is in his music a sense of struggle, of colliding tectonic plates, of a turbulent world rendered in rhythms which make the heart race and eventually resolve into moments of sublime, serenely lyrical melodies. The clouds part and a new vision appears. For a short time, we are taken out of the realm of earthly things. For a few exquisite moments, time stands still. Such is the power of his compositions. It is said that his music has a heavier, darker feel than either Haydn or Mozart. This sadder, more sorrowful style helped define to some extent who Beethoven is for us. His music matters. It has weight, substance, and vitality. Many of his works contain the hint of this darker part of himself, and even in his cheery pieces, 
there is usually a part that grabs your attention in a quick, dark manner. But grab us, he certainly does. No one who has heard his ode to joy can come away unmoved, thrilled by the urgency of the music. His work, like other composers, contains, I think, an essential contradiction, which for me mirrors the nature of our existence. His music fills us with a sense of completeness on the one hand, of emotional fulfillment, but also with a yearning for something else, an intimation of a reality which lies beyond notes. Call it the spiritual dimension, if you like. His music is both personal and universal in its scope and appeal. It calls to the senses and offers a tantalizing vision of a world beyond the material. It is both an affirmation and an inspiration. Out of the formless mass of potential melodies, he creates a sound picture which helps us focus our yearning for something more than the banal, the everyday, the ready-made. Now this is not the case with all great music. There are composers who challenge us with disturbing visions and who take us on journeys which shock and unnerve. Beethoven's music is restorative, I believe. It is also honest. By that I mean he acknowledges that nothing that we deem worthwhile in our lives is won easily. Just as he wrestled to express his innermost vision, so we too in our own fashion strive to give meaning, shape and substance to our lives. Of course, the roads to this are many. Some choose art, literature, religion. The journey above all requires courage, both moral and emotional, if we are to transcend our condition. We are fortunate indeed that we have been left the legacy of Beethoven's work as an example of one man's unique vision. Thank you. Thank you for that, Harold. That's really made me think. And um, I've been listening to Beethoven's music all week and, ah, oh, yes, great depths to it. Well, there's um, an opportunity to sing a hymn now. Um, if you would rather just read the words that are going to appear on the screen soon, that's fine. And uh, big thanks go out to Peter and Trevor, who've made this special recording for us. It's a well-known tune, Beethoven's magnificent Ode to Joy, from his really highly regarded and much loved Ninth Symphony, a choral symphony that's got, well, it's been so often performed, hasn't it? since its premiere in Vienna in 1824. Uh, that's the symphony, the Ninth Symphony, that Helen Keller listened to by feeling the sound vibrations on a radio, as we heard in our reading earlier on. The, um, the words that we're going to sing um, are from a humanist hymn. It's a valiant effort of um, hymn writing, but it does leave us a few challenges as we sing, trying to fit in the words on the right notes. But uh, thank goodness we're all going to be muted and we can sing out loud, safe in the knowledge that no one else will hear us. So do join in and sing along a Trevor, Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Oh, my dear. 
Well, personally, I'm looking forward to the time when we can sing together in person. But the one great thing about singing on Zoom is that I can make myself sound like an opera singer and none of you know what I'm doing. But there is that sign that comes across. You are muted. Would you like to unmute yourself? And I look on that as the devil incarnate trying to tempt me to sing aloud. Um, so some announcements now. My, think, my thanks go to uh, Jane and Janine for the crucial background work of hosting today. They make it look so simple, but it's not. And to Peter Crockford, our pianist, and Trevor Alexander, our soloist. It's really good to spend time with you all this morning. And we'll be back again uh, for next week's gathering at 10 a.m. here on Zoom when Jane will be leading our Advent service. Looking forward to that. You're also to welcome, you're welcome to join us for our 10.30 coffee morning on Tuesday. And we have a, a virtual coffee time to chat after the service in small groups if you'd like to join in today. Um, and we'd like, as always, to take a photo of us all as soon as the music ends. So do stick around if you don't mind being in a photo. We're going to um, have some closing words in a moment, followed by a Tyrolean song, one of Beethoven's arrangements of folk songs from various lands. And it seems to involve wearing a feather in your cap. And I hope it leaves you all in really good spirits and with a spring in your step for the day ahead. Those of us um, who are on Zoom, we might now like to uh, switch to gallery view so that we can see each other for the closing words and enjoy a feeling of connection in community. Let's just take a moment and have a little look at each other. It's very lovely to be with you here today and to just get a sense of all the different lives that are joining together. Good to see you. So I'm extinguishing our chalice flame, but not the warmth of this community. And I send the light of this candle out into the world that all people might be safe in expressing themselves as they know themselves truly to be. And may we, may we in the week ahead, may we be gentle observers of what it is to be human and allow ourselves opportunities to explore our own creativity, unique individuals that we are, and yet also part of the great expression of life itself here on our planet Earth home, spinning together in space. Journey well, everyone, and safely. Amen, and blessed be. Say